that we're here tonight is for Danny. Danny is the business development representative um, and aerospace specialist at Blue Ship. He specializes in the marketing department and he's been working there for around three years. This is Danny, you guys. Before I start, like, I'd like to thank both of them because they donated to us. They managed to donate you know, a nice machine, like SEM, Scan Electrical Scope Machine. And now we have it here at Calpoli, and we're waiting for the company. They can set up that in any room, and they are awesome, and they are here to support us all the time. Anything you need, they will be here. They will be for us, and that is what we have the whole meeting for the San Benoitian every month to just talk about what Calvary we need and take advantage of that kind of opportunity. That's it. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Al Kari and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo for having me here today, as well as Kevin Shanks and Norcal Chapter of Sambi. Really excited to, to be here to present to you guys, especially since in Denver, where I'm from, it's 20 degrees of snow, so much better weather. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Danny Kanaka. I'm part of the sales team here at Blue Shift, um, where at Blue Shift we manufacture specialty thermal protection systems. These are typically designed for lightweight structure and composite protection, um, where typical composite materials can't survive these very extreme environments. So we'll supply these very lightweight materials to help take these composites to the next level. So today, I'm going to talk to you guys about how composites in general have changed over the last few years, as well as some of the new technology that's being developed to help use some of these standard composites and integrate them into these very high temperature and issue environments. So, Hopefully, hopefully most of you or many of you have seen the new Top Gun movie that came out in last May. Um, so in the beginning of the Top Gun movie, Tom Cruise hops in what they call the Dark Star, which is uh, based on the SR-72 aircraft that Lockheed Martin is working on. And he takes this aircraft up to Mach 10 speeds, which is about 7,000 miles an hour. And as everyone can see, the aircraft lights, grow, lights up glowing red hot, and this is caused by the extreme aerodynamic heating. Uh, so it's a good thing that this is a fictional aircraft and that was just a movie as the fastest an aircraft outside of the, the spacecraft or spaceship that's traveled in the human is about a third of that speed so really 2,000 miles now so that being said the dark star was based on an aircraft that lockheed martin and a number of other defense manufacturers are trying to make uh, so these hypersonic vehicles are in development today and in order to create these hypersonic vehicles and allow for people to travel at some of these most extreme speeds some of the most advanced material systems have to be integrated to help either utilize standard composites or create new material systems. So as a result, engineers all over the world are looking for the most lightweight, thin, and easy to use materials to integrate and create these next generation composite vehicles. So before I dive into the technology, uh, I'd like to provide a little bit of background about myself, as well as the journey that, that Blue Chef has got to lead to this point. So um, regarding my background, I started working in composites uh, when I was at undergrad at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and I joined the Wisconsin Racing Team. And so as a part of this team, I was specifically part of the Aerodynamics and Composites group. Uh, but as a part of this group, we built mock Formula One cars at about one third size scale of, of standard cars. And at the end of the year, we race these cars against a bunch of different schools. So as a part of the Aerodynamics and Composites group, we were responsible for doing all the actual hand layout of these vehicles um, and building them from the ground up. So as you can see in the picture up here, the vehicle on the left is actually an electric powered or battery powered vehicle that we made. And then the one on the right is a combustion engine vehicle that we made. So it's been a really exciting ride and that's what got me introduced to composites to start. And then since then I joined Blue Shift. Um, and I've been with Blue Shift for the last three years where I've been working with composite designers and engineers that are trying to push that upper limit of survivability based on the composite material. So this ranges from aircraft designers to rocket scientists, to battery manufacturers, to medical device designers that are all sharing one same problem, or rather two problems. They are trying to make their systems more efficient, and they're trying to reach this upper level and beat out their competitors. So as a result, they really need to find and utilize the most advanced material systems to the world. So I'll switch over and provide a little background on Blue Shift. 
So uh, Blue Shift was established in 2013 in a lab uh, down at University of Texas Austin as the project actually with one of our co-founders and NASA to develop a polyimid aerogel. So this aerogel was originally designed to either build antennas or build substrates on top of the antennas. And our co-founder decided that this material could be utilized for a lot more than just building single antennas. So in 2013, they bought the licensing rights to manufacture the product and started coming up with these other ideas of, of how we could integrate the product into different materials. So fast forward six years, in 2019, uh, we moved our manufacturing facility from Texas up to Massachusetts. And from 2019 up until about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we were really focusing on producing this polyimid aerogel in a commercial format. And about two years ago, we realized that in order for other organizations or other customers to really integrate this product, to protect composites and lightweight structures, we had to make it a little bit more useful. So that's where we came up with these thermal protection systems and building multi-layer structures that can be directly applied to composites or integrated as a middle layer of composites to improve the temperature survivability. And so this has opened a number of doors, aerospace, defense, specialty electronics, and a wide range of other applications that will turn into it. So as I mentioned at Blue Shift, we make specialty thermal protection systems. Um, but that being said, we work best when we can work with a customer and they say, hey, I have a thermal challenge. You know, this is the, the temperature environment that I'm looking to mitigate. We really need some help based on space, based on weight. So our team can help design or suggest these multi-layer thermal protection systems to help meet and exceed those requirements. So many of these thermal protection systems based on functionality can support applications as low as minus 200 degrees Celsius, upwards to 2000 degrees Celsius and beyond. But the key thing about these is that they are designed for transient thermal insulation. So if you have a block of styrofoam and one of our thin thermal protection systems that really is this thing, looks like a sheet of paper, block of styrofoam is going to win all day. But what you can't use is putting these blocks of styrofoam into aircrafts, into rockets, into applications where every millimeter of space counts and you can only afford you know, so much space for so much weight. So these are really designed for that most extreme heat burst that transient thermal. How much the thickness? So this material here is actually the, the aerogel with an adhesive layer. This is 190 microns, so less than a quarter millimeter in thickness. Uh, the aerogel itself is 165 microns. It's in between. So as I mentioned, our, our manufacturing facility is in Massachusetts. Uh, we uh, we relocated in 2019. That's where we've been producing these vulnerable protection systems. So today uh, we'll start off and I'll talk a little bit about the core technology, the Aero Zero material that is the polyimid aerogel, as well as some of these thermal protection systems that we manufacture. Uh, we'll talk about some of the markets and applications where these thermal protection systems are currently being used to protect composites and lightweight structures. Then we'll dive into a couple of case studies of, of where the material has been integrated and its temperature performance. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the individual specifications of products and their variant functionalities as well. And if anybody has any questions along the way, happy to uh, feel free to jump in. And we can. So as I mentioned, the core technology being Aero Zero is a poly of an aerogel. And so this takes a combination of very, very low thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity, which restricts the heat flow through the very thin material, while it is very thin and lightweight. So this allows for it to be integrated into aircraft systems or any applications where space and weight is the utmost of a premium. Uh, the material has very high heat durability, so it has a lifetime continuous survivability range between minus 250 and 250 degrees Celsius. But most of these applications that we support are outside of these temperature regimes based on the, the multi layer construction. So we like to show this image as this is an SEM of the aerogel itself. As you can see and feel, it looks like a piece of plastic or a piece of paper, but under an SEM, it's very, very porous. Uh, so a fun trivia fact we have is in one A4 sheet or a sheet just like that, there's actually over 30 trillion pores in, in just one sheet. So it's a dense cross link structure, uh, which allows for it to trap all this air and has very, very low thermal conductivity and thermal digitivity, uh, which restricts that airflow. It's also a 100% polyimid material, so it's very chemically resistant and can be integrated as the, the leading edge material in many of these systems. 
So this is uh, the baseline construction of an Aero Zero thermal protection system, including the core insulated layer Aero Zero, as well as an adhesive layer and release liner. That's the material that, that I passed around. Um, basically, we start, we'll produce the Aero Zero in a roll-to-roll -roll format off our manufacturing line. Then we add these adhesives so it's more functional and can be directly applied. Um, and then we'll bond additional substrates to provide this additional functionality, such as metals, polyamides, flame-resistant materials, and we'll talk a little bit more about those different constructions and, and the applications that those are used for. What kind of adhesive can take that heat? No, great question. So we typically use a, a high-temperature silicone pressure-sensitive adhesive. It's graded up to 800F for an hour. As I've mentioned, many of these applications that these thermal protection systems are used for exceed that temperature limit, but the time limit is where that adhesive can be most successful. So as long as we're staying under that you know, extended time frame, the adhesive is typically the weakest link, um, but it's very easy to integrate. When you are using the whole system, you are taking the release liner out. Yes, exactly. So the release liner is just there for easy handling and movement. You can even on the sheet you have in your hand, peel and then feel it on the back. It's a low tack adhesive, so to your hand or to any oils, you won't feel like it's sticky, but if you press it on the desk, good luck getting it off. So to start, uh, we'll talk about the first and major use case of these thermal protection systems, which is protecting typically the outside of composites or lightweight structures. So this very this combination of very low thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity restricts the heat flow from some external heat source and protects the underlying composite structure from that heat. So depending on the configuration, it can exceed or it can withstand very, very high temperatures for this fairly short period of time. So this slide highlights a few different use cases where some of our thermal protection systems are currently being used. Uh, so the first use case starting on the left, this is a depiction of a carbon fiber launch vehicle or rocket. Um, so we're currently working with a few different launch vehicle manufacturers to protect the outside of their composite vehicles upon ascent and re-entry. And with one of our customers, we can actually protect the vehicle so well that as it re-enters, the composite structure underneath doesn't exceed its maximum temperature and allows for them to reuse this vehicle. So it's saving them a lot of money to not have to build in the tank of the rocket by just applying this sticker easily to the outside. That means that we stop using the metallic form. Well, exactly. Some some customers, you know, it's, it's easy to, to integrate these. Others that build the rockets out of metal is a little bit more difficult. Question? So I already take the lighter to the machine mm -hmm. passing around, it wouldn't burn. So if you took a lighter to that, it's it would it wouldn't burn or it would initially catch on fire, but it's self-extinguishing. So it's based on UL 94 BTM0, which is a flame classification, which essentially means that the material would self-extinguish. We have a couple different constructions which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, such as this one here, where if you take a direct flame in front of this for 25 minutes, there's no degradation of anything. So we can really build these thermal protection systems based on the functionality that some customers is looking for. So the next use case uh, that I want to mention is insulating some composite boxes around lithium ion battery cells or very high or high power density battery cells. So in many of these aircrafts, customers are trying to pack as many battery cells into one small area as possible so they can have more lift and increase their velocity. And as a result, these battery cells, when in such close contact, can heat up very easily and go into what's called thermal runway. And these thermal runway events, essentially one battery catches on fire, one battery cell catches on fire, propagates to the next adjacent battery cell, and that spirals out of control. So they need flame resistant materials inside of these battery containment units to help mitigate that flame and not let that pass over to the next battery unit. So in one of our constructions, we have a, a flame resistant barrier that I was just showing that can really mitigate that extreme thermal heat as those batteries start to, to go into thermal runway, but can protect the overall composite structure from, from getting the control. And then the last example that I, I want to mention here um, is what's called the electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft or EVTOL aircraft. So many of these EVTOL aircrafts, they look like flying taxis and there are a bunch of different manufacturers that are trying to come up with the fastest, most efficient, most passenger affording aircraft. 
Um, and as a result, they're using a bunch of different battery systems, trying to pack in as much as possible and similarly need this additional flame protection. Um, in addition, they have some bleeding edges and some more extreme aspects that need to be protected. And they can't, you know, take on any additional weight or any additional space. So they need the most lightweight materials. So it's another quickly moving and very interesting application where these thermal protection systems can be integrated. So this slide dives in a little bit more about some of the different applications of where these thermal protection systems are being used. Uh, but that being said, most integrators of these thermal protection systems for composite protection really see three key benefits. The first being fairly obvious, a thermal protection. They need to protect either the composite structure or some underlying electronic or temperature sensitive component from these extreme heats. So we can integrate a thermal protection system to help mitigate that thermal. The second application or second, I guess, rather feature that, that these provide is efficiency. So by replacing heavier, denser foams and denser materials such as cork that's currently being used along the outside of rockets, many of these customers then can you know, either increase or reduce the amount of fuel that they're using or they can increase their payload. They can repurpose that weight that was at one point, you know, just in their thermal protection system to a range of different areas. So it allows for them to just be much more you know, customizable with their system. And then the last feature that's, that's worth mentioning is the sustainability aspect. So I mentioned in terms of rockets, we're helping one rocket manufacturer protect it upon sun reentry so they can reuse that vehicle so they don't have to build an entire additional rocket. Um, in the case of batteries, we're replacing these denser legacy foams, which allow for them to either increase their power density and pack in additional battery cells, or they can, you know, by not having these batteries cycle too much, the lifetime of the batteries will be greatly extended with this light thermal protection system. All right, so the next couple of slides, uh, we'll talk about some case studies of using these thermal protection systems and some of the different composite materials that they protect. So this first case study focuses on using multiple layers of the aerozero material with an adhesive between it, protecting a peak substrate or poly either ether ketone. So peak typically can't see temperatures much above 200 to 250 degrees Celsius, and then it'll start to degrade. Uh, so we essentially, laminar, we put multiple layers of the aerozero material, expose the peak to a 300 degrees Celsius heat burst over 30 seconds. And as you can see by using just one layer of the TPS, there's upwards of 160 degrees Celsius temperature reduction. And by increasing the number of layers, you can further drive that temperature down. So we learned, you know, many of these thermal protection systems can be configured based on what that initial thermal environment that the customers see. And so we did a similar case study uh, with multiple layers of our Aero Zero, but this time protecting an aluminum substrate. And we found a unique relationship when we're protecting or rather adhere to materials that have very high thermal conductivity, such as aluminum, where that high thermal conductivity can actually very rapidly spread the heat out. And then once interfaced with the low thermal conductivity materials, such as ours, it restricts that heat flow very well. So by using just one layer of the Aero Zero, this time there's upwards of a 200 degree Celsius temperature range. And, and, uh, how is the silicon material can affect on the Aero Zero? from the heat. Sure, so the silicone adhesive does have a higher thermal conductivity than the material, which can sometimes make it less advantageous, but the average when we integrate the Aero Zero material will still keep that thermal conductivity very, very low and restricting the heat flow. And when combining it to other materials, it's the, the lowest typical thermal adhesive that, that we get. Of the elongations of the formation in the silicon material matching the aerosol? So, great question. Uh, the, the very porous nature of the aerogel actually allows for better adhesion, and the adhesive can seep into those pores just enough to where, you know, anytime the material is laminated to something else, if there's going to be any sort of adhesive failure, it'll be the, the adhesive that's being ripped off of the additional substrate. So, it has very strong adhesion to the aerogel based on its percentage. Uh, so again, as although it looks like you know increasing the number of layers in, in this construction doesn't drive the temperature down, we found by increasing what that baseline temperature is, so we have more data at 500 degrees Celsius, 800 degrees, and whatnot, that difference between the number of layers is much more substantial. So again, we'll build these multi-layer structures based on the type of heat as well as what the you know, composite structure material is going to be adhered to in the end. 
What is the PSA for silicon detail? Uh, PSA stands for pressure not release. Uh, relatively thin layers. How damage tolerant is it? Great question. So the aerogel itself, if you take a pen or even a fingernail and you scratch at it, there will be some degradation. So that's why typically we'll laminate it to these other materials that have more of a robust external nature, uh, such as a, a polyimid material here. So in some applications, you know, this is just a standard capped on polyimid film, uh, much more mechanically resistant. So we'll use it as that kind of external resupply layer. And that doesn't jeopardize the, the thermal properties too much in the sense that it's still advantageous. All right, uh, so this slide here shows uh, an Ashby plot comparing thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity of a wide range of materials. Um, and since the aerogel that we manufacture is 85% air, it has a thermal conductivity as close to air as, as most materials can. But the big difference is the thermal diffusivity of the aerogel is actually seven times lower than that of air. So that's what allows for it to be such a great blocker of heat as opposed to and as opposed to just you know letting heat transfer through air. It has that restrictive nature and restricts the actual rate of heat flow through the material. So despite it being so thin, it's really ideal for that the transmutation. So anything with a high heat burst or a low heat burst, cryogenic environments, protecting cryogenic tanks, things of that nature, if it's fuel applications, is where this material is. If they have any questions. All right. So we'd like to show this slide just to put perspective into how thin the material really is. So most of our built up thermal protection systems are less than one millimeter, really about a quarter millimeter in thickness. Um, and in comparison, the average coffee grinds are about 400 microns or, or about a half millimeter in thickness. And the limited visibility is actually 40. So the material itself is so thin that it's just barely, you know, a few form factors over the limit of visibility. All right, so the next couple slides, we'll talk about the different configurations of thermal protection system that we manufacture, as well as some features and the different aspects of their functionalities. So we've spent a lot of time talking about Aero Zero thermal protection systems, and we will continue to, but there are two other products that are worth highlighting, especially in the sense of composite protection. Uh, the first is what we call rocket tape, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It is tape that goes on the outside of rockets, um, but we designed it for it to be a more intuitive way to apply this material. So essentially, it's just a, a one inch wide by 25 foot long roll of tape in the same configuration as many of these thermal protection systems. Um, but we felt that this is a lot easier for customers or for other people to kind of play around with and, and directly apply. So again, these configurations, we can build them based on the exact same as the aerosol thermal protection system, but this is designed for if you're working on some application and you have a hot spot, we have some area that you want to apply just some level of, of thermal insulation, but you don't have that much room, you can't integrate fiberglass or something like that, that this material would be really easy. And then another product worth mentioning is what we call BX TPS or Blue Shift TPS. And so these are much thicker thermal protection systems, uh, typically using some legacy insulated materials, such as ceramics or fiberglass materials. But our team will design them and, and create them based on functionalities requested from customers. So we can build them up to certain thicknesses, and these are integrated for more steady state applications since they're on that, that thick nature. So this slide highlights six of our commonly used thermal protection systems and some of their different configurations. Uh, we use a lot of acronyms. Uh, so essentially all the additional layers are just what that further you know, top layer or super straight is. Uh, starting at the top left, it's the first material that I talked about. It's just our baseline Aero Zero insulator with an adhesive layer. So this is designed for internal components where they don't need some additional abrasion or protection, but they still need that thermal insulation. Uh, the material in the middle, AZTPS FRB, stands for Flame Resistant Barrier. So this is one of our more robust thermal protection systems. Um, again, this is designed for enclosures of batteries or anywhere where there's a direct flame that needs to be mitigated. Um, as, as you can see and feel compared to some of the other ones, it's, it's a little bit more tough, but that's based on its construction and ability to withstand flames so well. And then continuing to move right, 
AZTPS PI stands for polyimid. So one additional feature of, of the Aero Zero material, since it's 85% air, it's also RF transparent. So in applications where you're protecting a signal, whether it's a sensor or it's a radome or it's some internal electronic component, and you can't use any sort of metal because it'll block that RF signal, this material works very, very well to help, you know, help not block that RF signal while still maintaining and, and providing that thermal protection. And the polyimid layer acts as that external abrasion resistance layer, so it can be leading edge or, or outward facing. And then the, the next thermal protection system worth mentioning in the bottom left is AZTPS with a graphite superstrate. So this one is much more malleable, uh, much easier to, to fold. And as you can see and feel, it's very easy to integrate. Um, but that being said, this is the material that's being used for the outside rockets. So graphite has very, very high thermal conductivity. And when exposed to these high temperatures, it will rapidly spread that heat out across the axis of lifetime. Whereas our material with a very low thermal conductivity, again, will restrict that heat flow. So the combination of these two materials across a large interface can help directionally control heat very well. And then the thermal protection system in the center, uh, AZTPS BEA PI stands for Vapor Deposited Aluminum. And so this is uh, a very reflective TPS that's being used on protecting composite applications such as satellites, where both convection and conductive heat are not a concern, and radiative heat is the largest concern. So you need some reflective material that can help dissipate that heat and reflect it away. And then the last thermal protection system worth mentioning on the slide is AZTPS, which generically labeled metals. As we have incorporated a wide range of different metals, aluminum, stainless steel, some higher temperature metals like molybdenum, uh, based on application requirements, if the thickness or if the, the weight requirement allows it, but they still need a much more robust external layer. So these have a, a few different applications as well. Good question. I was wondering about those six um, types you mentioned. Are um, all of them supposed to be, uh, you know, you put on one, you're good to go, or are they uh, one time use? And so the graphite one, for example, is that one of late, or is it? Uh, good question. So graphite one. It's not designed to oblate. Um, in some of the reentry applications, there are areas along the rocket that the graphite will delaminate partially from the silicone adhesive. And what we've done to help mitigate that is one of two things, either supply additional graphite with an adhesive as a patch, or we can make this with a thicker graphite that helps stick you know, a little bit better in some of those applications. So they're mostly designed for one-time use, but it really depends on how extreme of an environment it is, um, as well as if it's you know leading edge or external facing as opposed to on the inside of the component. And it's the same thickness of that adhesive or the yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll typically use one, we, we use a wide range of adhesives based on some application requirements. We'll typically use silicone pressure sensing adhesive because it works very well. It's very temperature stable. That being said, in some space applications where outcasting is a concern, you can't use any silicones. So we have some low outcasting pressure sensitive adhesives that we can also incorporate. But the adhesive is about 25 microns in thickness. It's the typical adhesive that we use. So as I mentioned, we have six or really more than six core thermal protection systems with those different configurations. Um, but we very often will customize these based on certain customer's application requirements. So that includes adding additional layers of the AeroZero AeroGel, um, adding additional multifunctional layers such as multiple layers of graphite with polyimid protective layer or whatever the system calls for. So we can really design it based on thickness requirements, thermal requirements, or material as well. So this slide highlights the AZTPS with the flame barrier a bit more. Um, as I mentioned, this material is being integrated into different battery systems for different applications where there is a direct flame and it needs to be mitigated. So we've actually exposed the material to a 1,000 degree flame for 25 minutes. And as you can see in, in these three pictures here, uh, the three on the bottom are just the front side of the material after being exposed. Whereas this picture on the top is the backside of that material after being exposed for 25 minutes. As you can see, there's no degradation of the material, no discoloration, and, and no flame penetration. And another 
The reason why this material is this easily integrated into battery systems is it's very electrically isolating. So in, in some of these battery systems, you know, most of the, the cells are made out of or rather covered in a metal layer. So if any other metals come in contact, it can quickly short circuit the battery and they need some electrical isolation layer that can help maintain that as well. How long it can be made to catch on fire? Sorry? How long it will be made to catch on fire? Sure. So you know, based on our testing, after 25 minutes of direct flame, this flame won't spread. Um, we're starting to do some longer terms, so you know, we don't exactly know what that upper limit is. Uh, but based on customer testing requirements, 25 minutes is a, a decent range for when, you know, let's say an aircraft would need to yeah. land because there's some sort of issue with batteries. Thank you. So this slide highlights the AZTPS with a polyamine super trait a bit more. Um, as I mentioned, this material is ideal when you need, uh, obviously, lightweight thermal protection system, but especially important when you're looking for an RF transparent system. So you can't integrate a metal material. This can be protecting different nose cones, radomes, antenna substrates, or anything where RF seg signal transfer is, is very important. But again, you need this, the most lightweight material uh, to help protect some of these different structures. And so by including an RF transparent subject, this allows for a more controlled and potentially faster flight as well. So the uh, AZTPS with the graphite superstrate, as I mentioned, graphite does a great job spreading out that heat in the X to Y plane, uh, whereas our material, the Aero Zero, restricts the heat flow underneath into the C plane and protects the underlying composite structure or lightweight structure very well. So the material is very, very bendable, very foldable. Um, we make it in the roll to roll process and we can provide it in sheets and rolls. We also do some custom parts. So if there's a very complex geometry that it needs to be wrapped around, whether it's a joint or to some internal component, uh, the material can be bent in and flexed to that as well. So this slide uh, talks about the thermal protection system with the stainless steel barrier. Um, as I mentioned, stainless steel does a great job restricting heat flow and especially restricting flame penetration. So we'll often combine this material either with the flame resistant barrier or we can combine it with other materials such as fiberglass to help withstand longer term insulation. Question? So you put the stainless steel on that you did the graphite? Exactly. Yeah, so we have, we'll start just with the aerogel and we'll typically bond adhesive to both sides and then we'll take that material and we have roll to roll stainless steel, different types of metals and similar lamination process. So it's a little bit more robust, but it's still a very, very thin stainless steel sheet. Up to how much thickness? Uh, so I have, I can pass the one around, but it's about 50 microns in thickness. Oh. So still, still very, very thin, but it feels a bit more robust. Be a little careful with the edges because it is stainless steel. But again, stainless steel is just one of the metals that have been integrated. We've worked with some much higher temperature, more obscure metals based on what the requirements are. So this one talks about uh, AZTPS with a vapor deposited polyamide layer, or vapor deposited aluminum on top of a polyamide layer. So again, very, very low emissivity, high reflectivity. It's being used in satellite applications or applications where radiative heat is dominated and you need to reflect away in that heat. So the material, despite being very, very thin, acts with a, you know, uh, the higher mirror finish is better, and this will help restrict and, and flow away. All right, so the next slide, the next few slides, we'll talk about the thicker thermal protection systems that, are, that we call BX or, or blue shift thermal protection systems. So the picture here on the left shows one example of the role of thermal protection system that we manufacture. It has a, a fiberglass material that we've integrated, followed by an aluminum or a stainless steel exterior. And so this, again, has been designed to be, you know, based on a certain functionality requested, such as rocket engine insulation, some different turbo components of, of automobiles, um, or these very, very high temperature applications where temperature is an issue, vibration is an issue, and these longer term requirements. And the aerosol embedded on the fiberglass as percentage or as a sheet? So we've done a little bit of both. Um, mostly we'll integrate it as a sheet just because we have a lot of the material. We've done some testing to integrate some aerogel particles into these fiberglass materials, which would allow for different functionalities as well. 
So as I mentioned, these thicker thermal protection systems are designed for certainly more extreme events, but rather closer to steady state applications. So much longer term uh, where you need a, a traditional insulated layer, but you know you can't just buy an off the shelf insulation material. You need something that has this additional functionality uh, so we can design and, and make these to help protect composite structures for that longer term. So again, really designed for that rocket engine or high-end turbo components or, or even automobile engines. Uh, so the next couple of slides will talk about rocket tape and some of the different configurations and why those are used. So as I mentioned, you know, the constructions are very similar to the aerozero thermal protection systems. However, these are in a more easy to use and more intuitive way to, to incorporate for design houses if you have some little area that you need to protect from thermal or protect from the thermal environment. So the graphite material I personally have used on the back side of my car, right above my exhaust, works really well to help spread out that heat. But again, it's just a material that's very thin, very easy to integrate. So it's a great one to have kind of in, in different R&D labs and, and in the machine shop if there's some additional component that, that you need to protect. How much the bromide take heat up to what? Sorry? The bromide? The, the polyimid? Yeah. yeah, so the polyimid, is a, it's a standard polyimid material, so it can't see much above 300 degrees Celsius, um, depending on what the time frame is and depending on what the heat source is. So if it's more of a radiative heat or depending on rather what that air gap is from the heat source, um, the material will be exposed. But if it's the most high temperature applications, we'll typically suggest using a, a graphite or a different metal exterior. Yeah, more than 300 degrees. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. So one of the main differences with rocket tape and your standard insulation tapes, or rather just polyimid tapes, is that it combines this factor of being a chemically resistant and high temperature resistant material and to be an insulated material. So rather than having to use you know, a standard fiberglass cloth or a standard just insulation material and then take some adhesive or take some chemically resistant layer like a polyimid or a Kapton tape over it, you can use these rocket tapes or thin insulated tapes for that two-in-one. So it's really easy to, to apply and you know, replaces the time of having to integrate with, with different materials. So this, this chart here just kind of highlights some of the different key features of rocket tape, similar to the AeroZero thermal protection system products. You know, they're very, very thin, typically less than a quarter millimeter in thickness. They can be built or wrapped around multiple times if there's some component that needs some additional level of thermal protection. Uh, they're typically all electrically insulative or non-conductive. If you use the graphite materials, it's a different story, but most of these materials, given that they're either polyimid or based or entirely polyimid, they are electrically insulating. Um, it's also uh, a key feature of the product is that it has very low dielectric properties. So we've started to integrate the material into different printed circuit board configurations or applications where you need something with very, very low dielectric features. Uh, so again, this kind of goes hand in hand with the electrical insulation properties. And lastly, it's, it's wide temperature usage. So it has this continuous lifetime temperature use between minus 200 and 250 C, but as long as it's exposed to these more extreme temperatures for relatively short periods of time, that's when the insulation factor is, is the best one. So this slide just talks about one of the case studies that we've done integrating rocket tape and comparing it to a standard polyimid or Kapton tape. So both materials were placed on a hot plate exposed for uh, 30 minutes and afterwards the temperature of both tapes or rather both tapes were felt. We tried to do it with an ice cube and outside and put together this whole video, but the, it was a little bit difficult to see. So the most important factors about it is that there was upwards of a, a four times better thermal insulation factor by using this thin tape compared to just standard cap on tape that's used for, for many of the same applications. So another use case of integrating the AeroZero polyamide aerogel and these thermal protection systems for composite protection is actually as an interlayer to reduce the overall thermal conductivity of the composite structure, uh, basically because it's taking out additional layers of either fiberglass or carbon fiber and integrating the slow thermal conductivity material. So since it's so porous, it can be integrated into different pre-priced systems without the use of adhesive 
and can be cured the same way as a standard carbon fiber or a standard co-curing process. And since the material, again, has very little thermal conductivity, it works very well to reduce that overall structure. So this is just a representative construction of what we've done and, and what you can do essentially layering in the arrow zero within between different layers of prefrag to build up your standard composite structure. So this slide just highlights a few different composite structures. How you bond it from the other side of the zone? Sorry? How you bond it with the other side? So if, are you saying, well, if you put it in between two prefrag panels, are you saying if the aerosol is next? It's very smooth and shiny and from the other side okay. of the aerosol. So the, the material, although it looks very smooth and shiny, you can essentially just you know layer the material over a prefrag. And then if you wanted to, you know, wrap the material up into a roll so it could be cut and reused, but it would be able to stick very well just to that slight surface of the, the prefrag. And given that it's so porous, it allows for that prefrag or the epoxy to seep into the porous and create burn adhesion on both sides. So this is just a, you know, an instruction of how the material could be applied to those prefrag structures and rolled up if you were to have much larger roll and then you know cut individual components so you can stack it on as well. So this was some of the, the testing that we did comparing a standard carbon fiber sheet to just the aerogel material as well as the overall thermal conductivity after the material has been exposed. So starting on the left, you know, a traditional carbon fiber material is about anywhere from a quarter millimeter up to a half millimeter in thickness with a thermal conductivity of about 0.17 watts per meter Kelvin. Whereas the aerogel material that we make has a very low thermal conductivity at 0 0.03 watts per meter Kelvin. And by integrating two materials together, the overall thermal conductivity of the structure was reduced by up to 60%. And so it's reduced down to 0 0.06 watts per meter Kelvin when applied together. And we did a similar study with fiberglass. So by integrating our materials to different fiberglass structures, you can drastically reduce the thermal conductivity that way as well. And so one question that customers often ask is, okay, well, you're integrating an aerogel into a much more robust structure. How does that affect the mechanical properties? So we've done some testing with up to 18 layers of our material integrated in between layers of carbon fiber and Kevlar um, and tested both the mechanical properties uh, to see how well and rather you know, how much it diminishes. And as you can see, by using nine layers of our material, there is nearly no mechanical degradation or no change. And by using up to 18 layers, there's a slight degradation of, of mechanical strength, but that material, you know, the thermal conductivity would be so far drastically reduced to where probably would make sense to put 18 layers anyway. Um, <clears throat> you put like an aerogel between two layers of the different composite materials. Will that affect delamination between them? So we've done numerous testing depending on the, the co-curing cycle of the material. It can be integrated to whatever the standard co-curing cycle is, and there's no permanent or there's no easy way to, to delaminate the material. So that porous nature really locks it in very well. Yeah, do you have any graphs comparing other uh, material that would be comparable to the aerogel? In terms of like the yeah, so I can go back to the, the Ashby plot here. Um, sure, so this slide shows Thermal conductivity up on uh, the axis here and thermal density here compared to a range of different materials that are similarly used. So you can see, you know, different foams and whatnot, as well as polymers are slightly higher thermal conductivity. There are foams that have similar thermal conductivity, but the real difference maker here is thermal diffusivity. There aren't materials out there, with the exception of aerogels, that have such low thermal diffusivity, and there really aren't aerogels that have this combination of thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity as well. Can you explain the difference between the silica aerogel? Absolutely, yeah. So there are a few different types of aerogel out there, and most commonly known is silica aerogel. So silica aerogels, if you've ever seen one, it looks almost like a cloud. It's really fascinating material, but they make them in thick blocks. So you can take a blowtorch to a silica block, put your hand on the other side, and you'll feel no thermal impact. 
It has similar, maybe even a little bit lower thermal conductivity than our material. But the issue with silica is they're very, very brittle. So if you put that same block between your hand, you can easily crunch it with your fingers, and it'll send silica particles everywhere. So especially when integrating into these vibration-esque environments, um, you know, some of the very extreme temperature environments, none of that silica can be exposed or, or you know, particulate into different areas. So you really can't use these silica aerogels for these extreme applications. We're also the only manufacturer of a thin polyimid aerogel in the world because we have the technology patent. So people are, are really struggling to, to find usable ways of silica aerogels, whereas this material is very easily integrated into these thermal protection systems. How much the percentage of the aerogel in the silica? When you have that, when you put it in a, in a silica aerogel, how much is aerogel? Yeah. Um, I think it, it really ranges. So they make a, a bunch of different concentrations based on how low of thermal conductivity you're looking for. Um, there's a wide range of variety of different silica aerogel manufacturers. But I do know the more increased silica percentage, the more brittle the material becomes. So again, just makes it that much more difficult to. Exactly. So you can get very low thermal conductivity with the silica aerogel, but how well can it be integrated into the system based on the damage? Uh, one thing I know about silicon aerogels is that they're quite um, not very weather resistant with respect to water. Mm -hmm. um, with your product, uh, do you see the similar degradation in thermal properties when exposed to moisture, or does it remain relatively constant? So the, the material when exposed to moisture, since it is an open cell material, it will allow for the, the fluid or whatever moisture to penetrate through it. So that's why typically we'll supply it with a polyimid layer or some external abrasive layer to persist that, that liquid flow through. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much the thermal properties are impacted when exposed to liquid, but again, that's just mostly because we'll put them in a situation where something else would be restricting that liquid. All right, so the next couple of slides, uh, we'll talk about, again, just kind of recapping some of those markets, where these thermal protection systems are being used, um, and where customers are finding success. So again, in the theme of aerospace, you know, the three key themes, thermal efficiency and sustainability, is, is fairly renowned for, for all of our markets. But by protecting that composite structure that can only see typically, you know, such as carbon fiber, can only see 180, 185 degrees Celsius, can now be exposed to 500 to 2000 degrees Celsius for these short periods of time without degrading. So it's allowing for customers to really push that upper limit of survivability with standard composite materials. And as a result, in the efficiency sense, we're replacing much, much thicker materials. So again, in aerospace, the common or one of the most common thermal protection systems being used to protect composites is cork, the cork that's used in wine bottles. It's very, very heavy. It's not very easy to handle, and it's difficult to, to conform to you know, complex geometries such as large rockets. So by replacing that, we're making these systems much more efficient, much more lightweight, and allow for them to increase payloads and things like that. And then obviously sustainability in the sense of rockets. If you can reuse your rocket, you don't have to build it, and all that material usage is, is very big savings. And then in terms of battery housings, again, this mitigating thermal runway is a really large concern for any customers that are trying to make the most power dense applications, but they still need to be protected by a composite structure so it can be integrated into their systems. So if we're allowing for customers to use these standard composite materials and just apply these different thermal barriers on the inside and allow for you know, these composite structures to see a thousand degrees C flame for up to 25 minutes. And in a similar sense, you know, these materials are replacing thicker, denser foams, um, you know, which allows for them to either increase the power density or create a more lightweight situation that can increase lift or flight in many of these other aircraft systems. And then in the terms of defense, um, you know, again, these materials can be integrated for nose cones, radomes, antennas, any applications where you can integrate typical metal or you can integrate a typical legacy insulator because of weight and space, uh, but you still need some level of thermal protection and you don't want to increase what that composite material is. So in terms of peak 
Temperature survivability is more like 250 degrees Celsius, but now can be exposed to that 5 to 600 degrees Celsius during that flight path. I believe that is all. So if there are any other questions. Oh, on one of your slides, you're showing that stacking, the stacking of the layers. Is there a benefit to stacking versus just making a thicker layer of aerogel and doing like one layer versus maybe three thinner layers stacked up? Great question. So in short answer to that, a thicker aerogel would be better. The, the, the issue with that is it's very difficult to produce this aerogel as is. So where we found continued success is just by taking the one layer and bonding it to itself. We've done some work to help increase that thickness as well as decrease that thickness for other applications, but a thicker aerogel substrate would have better thermal challenges. Thank you. I have a question more for like the aerospace applications. You've talked a lot about how they have a lot of resistance to thermal degradation. Um, I know for aerospace things, it's really important um, to have leading edge protection. So to have what what is this? How does this compare to other materials as far as degradation from other forms like weathering or something on a long scale term, 10, 20 years or so? Great question. So these materials are not designed for very long term repeated use where we've protected an assortment of different leading edges. Most of our customers have either came back for a replacement material or a replacement external subject uh, or sub substrate. So it can be used for those leading edges, but it's not for you know repeated use or long term. With this, do you work in a wet layer technique as well, or would it affect the property of the material? Uh, I'm not sure how how the material would withstand a wet layout. Um, that being said, it's very chemically resistant, so it wouldn't degrade the material. I, you know, we'd have to do some trials to see how the curing cycle would be different, but I imagine the material would be able to to be exposed or be an inner layer of wet layer too. Maybe after they glue it, they have a technique, then they can add that material to the different wind cycles. Certainly. And, you know, that's that's where we found a lot of success is adding material after curing, um, but, you know, it could potentially be, be post or pre cure as well. So, when you have the material in between two layers of pre break, say, um, and you have to do a thermal curing cycle, mm -hmm. would it, like, does that affect? How the heat can cure the epoxy at all, since it's such a, it's providing thermal conductivity, basically. Yeah, it's a good question. So where we found, or I guess based on our testing, we've exposed it to very low temperature cure cycles as well as very rapid high temperature cure cycles, and there hasn't been any mechanical degradation or rather, you know, lack of curing because of the insulated layer. We think it's mostly because the edges are typically going to be exposed, so the heat will be able to come in from different sides rather than trying to just penetrate through the entire stack. Yeah, of course. More questions? Also, uh, for anybody online, if you have any questions, feel free to chime in. Looks like there's no online takers. And if you're talking, you're on mute. All right. Well, fantastic overview, Danny. Awesome. Thank you all very much for, for having me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Danny and the Kevin, to be here with us and help us to know more about the new future materials. But let me give you the story. In 2013, I opened a club. No, 2010, I opened a club. It's called Green Material, just only for the aerosol material. And the two students, one from civil engineer and the one from material science, they developed the club and they started the new business. Just how to use the aerosol powders inside the hemp materials between the wall for isolations. And the company, I think you can look online, the two students, they had the Dr. Badawi, he was with me helping them, right, Dr. Badawi? Can you elaborate on it a little bit? What? Uh, 
in terms of their progress, what they were. Doing. I think the point you're trying to make is that uh, it is good for everyone to try and again, uh, the sky is the limit for what you can do with these materials, and you never know whether this will take you on some point. And by the way, he's a specialized in the materials, and that's what we're working on that material, how you can embed it between the wall to minimize the thickness of the wall isolations. With the percentage of the aerosol in the handle material. And they came up with that, and then they had the one company now, and they are growing in the market. They collected $160,000, like a startup. Here to look at one thing. Just to give you some idea, like I was so interested to work in the original since 2010, even before the company started what? 2013, right? I hope I can grow in that area, but it's too late now. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions, guys, about that material? Like the aerogel itself, you make a Yeah, sure. So the, the aerogel, we now make it in a roll to roll continuous process. So we do quality checks, of course, the material, but it is a very repeatable continuous. We had originally manufactured in a batch process, uh, but once we figured out a little bit more, you know, how to develop it and, and continuously produce it, we switched to the roll to roll format. How do you make it from the bottom? So I can't speak to too much on how silica aerogels are made from powders just because polyamine aerogel that we make is made in an entirely different process. Um, but I know that it's an infused powder that they then integrate into either different fibers or fiberglass materials and can help build these structures. Okay, thank you so much, you guys. If you have any question, you can hang out here and we still have some days outside and feel free to talk to Kevin and Danny if you have a question. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.